Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is a uranium market expert. He founded the popular uranium website, Uranium Insider, he, which is the leading newsletter for solely focused on uranium energy and uranium mining companies, also uranium equity, so nuclear power companies. Justin Yoon, thank you for joining me. Hey, it's great to be back, Jason. Thanks for having me. So, Justin, we're recording this interview on Friday, September 8th, 2023. We've had a big rally in uranium miners the last couple months. Why do you what do you think is the main driver of uranium prices and the uranium stocks lately? Well, I would say that the, the main driver of the uranium stocks is the uranium price, uh, usually. Uh, most of the time, they tend to kind of track each other, and the miners often will will offer some leverage to that price. And we just had uh, the month of August, we had the uranium price, spot uranium price rise by almost $5 a pound in the month of August. And this is considerably anomalous action. August is typically the slowest month of the year in the uranium markets and in all markets, really, but uh, it's no no exception for uranium. And you have nuclear fuel buyers out on vacation. They're typically, there's low volumes being traded in the spot market. And this month, actually, the volumes weren't huge in the spot market, but the market is just so incredibly thin that even with average trading volume in the spot market, we saw the price rise almost $5. It's very, very unique to see that type of price action for this commodity at that time of year. And we think it's setting up for a bigger move going into Q4, which is usually the uh, kind of, for lack of a better word, the strongest time of the year for the commodity and for the equities as well. And finally, we've started to see significant inflows into the ETFs on the uranium ETF. So that's URA, URNJ, which is the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF, a junior uranium IT miners ETF, and then URNM. And all three of these ETFs combined, the share issuance in the month of August led to over $100 million worth of buying of their underlying holdings. And this month alone, only six trading days in September, there's already been more than 50 million in mandated buying coming from these three ETFs. So the flows are starting to come back into the sector. And that, of course, moves all of the underlying holdings of these ETFs. And happy to see some money finally start to show up in the sector again and i think that the movement of the spot prices is, is largely what is moving that we've seen the uranium miners distance themselves kind of from a lot of other commodities although oil has had a rally but the narrative out there is that there's a recession coming you see problems with the banks and credit commercial real estate but the uranium sector seems to really have distanced itself lately compared to that and before the news that we saw lately out on cameco We've actually seen a big rally in the uranium shares before that. So you think then that that was mostly because of the spot price um, rallying lately? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's 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 a unique investment in that the fundamental setup for the growth of nuclear energy and the growth of valuation for the uranium mining stocks has been obvious and improving for a very long time. It's just that the equities kind of go up and down and, and do what equities do with markets risk on, risk off. And We've had one big, big leg up from November, uh, excuse me, December 2020 until November 2021. We've had one big leg down, big consolidation for about 18 months. And I think we're starting the very early stages of this kind of wave three move for the sector. So the fundamental case has never been clearer. Um, it's the growth of nuclear is significant. Uh, the projected growth for the next 15 plus years is, you know, anywhere from three to four up to possibly up to 6% compound annual growth rate per year. That's incredible for this industry. We haven't seen that type of growth since the 1970s and 1980s for nuclear. So uh, that setup is strong. The Chinese are building plants like crazy. The US is life extending their older plants. Uh, the Japanese are restarting their plants more quickly. But the supply side is, is still in question. And we've had multiple disruptions to supply. Just in the past six weeks, we've had a coup in Niger that has uh, potentially impacted some of the developing companies in the country. Primarily, that would be Global Atomic and their DASA project is probably going to be delayed due to financing impacts of this. Um, and just today, Arano, who has been operating in Niger for about 50 years, announced that they are going to halt the processing of uranium in Niger. And there's a lot of conflict between the Nigerian coup and, uh, and the French. So that's tricky. Then just a few days ago, Cameco announced that they expect less production this year from both their Cigar Lake and MacArthur River mines. And there's just a lot of complex problems with supply, yet demand is stable and growing. Um, so, so really what we're looking at is the equities finally kind of catching up to the story and the movement of the spot price, especially 
this movement is happening without secondary demand. It's not happening from financial players, primarily the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. The movement is happening organically from buying from the industry. And that's a very, very positive point. And I think that the equities are finally waking up to that. You also don't have uh, the Japanese nuclear power plant companies like TEPCO offloading a lot of their nuclear supply back onto the market. So that ended a while ago. I don't think Kazataprom is oversupplying the market like they did for many, many years. And then you did mention Cameco, but the other part of that story, so they they are having production problems at their mines. And normally for a mining stock, that would be bad. However, what Cameco also said in the earnings release, Justin, was that they're going onto the spot market, right? And they're actually buying new supply because they have to go buy more supply in the spot market too to meet some of their contract demands. Yeah, it's it's sort of true. I mean, I mean, yes, they did say that. That is true. Um, Cameco's we need to buy pounds narrative always seems to be kind of a market statement more than a statement of reality. And by, the meaning behind that is basically their joint ventures, uh, in specific, the Inkai project counts as purchases as far as their production goes. Um, and so if they're coming out and saying we are, we're going to need to buy uranium, they probably already did that buying. Um, they also, out of any company, they have more levers to pull than anywhere than any other company. So they're not going to ever be kind of the buyer of last resort or like a sloppy spot market buyer. So there was a lot of speculation kind of on Twitter right after that, right after that statement that you just highlighted that they were about to come into the spot market to buy 3 million pounds. And that's just not the case. Um, so if the spot market pulls back a couple of bucks, you know, Cameco is probably going to be a floor and that floor is probably in the high 50s. Um, if we see that pullback, I don't know that we will, considering how quiet the market is, uh, the the spot market and the price continues to move higher. But you know, Cameco has other levers they, that they can pull, and they'll they'll make sure that they get that covered. But either way, yes, less production equals more purchasing, and they probably have already done that covering because by the time they announced that, I'm sure that the signs were the writing was on the wall that their production wasn't going to hit those goals. But yes, either way, it's it's a very very tight market, and this is not helping. Now, you said before we started recording that you get daily updates on the spot price. The retail investor doesn't get these normally um, because I was checking some of the spot price websites that I normally check in Cameco's website. It hasn't updated since the end of July for contract long-term contract price and spot price. And I just checked Business Insider and they haven't updated the uranium spot price in 10 days. But at these uh, current spot prices, which you said were uh, over $61 a pound right now, and they're up substantially recently, do you expect Kazataprom to start increasing production? Because that's kind of worrying because they're basically what the Saudi Arabia of uranium mining, they're the low cost producer. Do you think then that they could rapidly increase new supply online? Rapidly? No, they can't. But yes, they will increase supply, but they're not spot market sellers. And more and more of their supply is going to go to China and Russia and specifically China. So it's, it's not a concern whatsoever. Yes, they will be able to expand production. Um, I honestly think that they have far more in-ground resources than they let on. They have perfect geology for cheap uranium production, but it does take time. You know, it takes 12 to 18 months to uh, to drill out a well field and inject the lixivian sufficient to start extracting uranium. Um, then it's another, you know, six months before that peak production and every single well field immediately declines after that peak. And so they have to constantly, constantly be drilling. It's a big effort. It's expensive. It takes an expansion of a, of a, of the uh, workforce. It takes an expansion of sulfuric acid production. And with new deposits, they also have to go through their own bureaucratic channels for approvals and permits and licenses and all of that. So, you know, like Arano has announced a new joint venture with Kazakhstan um, just in the past six months or so that that mine is going to take probably five years to be producing. So it's going to take time. They will increase production. But even the CEO, the former CEO of Kazatomprom, I should say, um, famously last year basically said we need three more Kazatom proms by the end of the decade. So we need this production is, is what I'm saying. Um, they're not going to be the producer that's going to ramp up production 10 million pounds in a single year. And that extra 10 million goes into the spot market to keep prices down. Um, we're, we've now entered a market that is just so unbelievably thin with such a robust and growing demand picture that that extra production will go into end user hands probably going to be the Chinese. And you think then that those contracts to China and some of the other uh, countries that are building a lot of new nuclear power plants, those will be on long-term supply contracts at a higher fixed price than the spot market? 
Um, yes, along along with uh, you know their own projects as well. So, for example, the Chinese kind of has a multi multifaceted approach. They have always stated that they plan to be one third, one third, one third. So, a third domestic production, a third in long term contracts, and a third with overseas projects, uh, ownership of overseas projects. First of all, they'll never get a third of their needs domestically. That will never happen unless and until we've got two hundred to two hundred fifty dollar uranium sustained, and they can start pulling it out of phosphate tails. Unlikely to happen in the near term, or even in the mid term, or possibly ever. Uh, but that's their only real large domestic source of uranium, and it's so expensive it doesn't make sense. So what the Chinese are doing right now is they're expanding in both their contracting and in their M and A. So most recently in Kazakhstan, uh, CNNC, Chinese National Nuclear Company, entered into such a large contract with Kazatomprom that Kazatomprom had to have a special. Uh, a special vote, shareholder vote, to approve this contract. We still don't know necessarily the size of that contract, but it's big enough to be at least fifty percent of the book value of the company itself. So it's a huge contract, and the Chinese will continue to develop joint ventures with Kazakhstan going forward. And I, that that point is really important because you have to look at where this expansion is going to come from with Kazatomprom and where their recent joint ventures are. So the recent joint ventures are with the French. The French are already short uranium. They're having problems in Niger, and they're short uranium to begin with. So, expanded production from Kazakhstan going to France is unlikely to come into the market and disrupt price. Then, the other most recent joint venture is with Russia. Forty-nine percent ownership went to Rosatom in December for the Budenovskoy six and seven blocks. It's a massive mine. Half of it's going to Russia. The other half, Kazatomprom, can sell. And the West is increasingly. Uh, concerned about Kazakhstan production due to their increasing ties with Russia and the problematic shipping route heading west through the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, etc. So, really, what we're looking at is even with an expanded production base, most of the pounds coming out of Kazakhstan are going to increasingly stay in the east. And most of the nuclear demand is in the West, so it's kind of this natural bifurcation, even without actual official sanctioning. The reason I bring up Kazatoprom is that the supply sources, Kazatoprom is the largest source of supply for our listeners that out there who are not familiar. I know Justin's familiar with this, but I, I would argue that for the uranium bear market post Fukushima, and I would argue it lasted about ten years. Two of the main reasons the bear market lasted so long: number one, you had a lot of uh, angst and uh, countries that were changing the safety protocols for building new nuclear power plants post Fukushima. So a lot of um, building of new nuclear power plants were delayed. The other problems were on the supply side. So during that period, the 10-year bear market, you actually had Kazataprom ramping up production, uranium mine supply, and dumping it onto the market at not good prices. Uh, they were making money, but no one else was for a long period of time for seven, eight years. So Kazataprom actually, if you go back on their website and their English website and look at a chart of their production growth, they were growing production enormously post Fukushima during the uranium bear market while every other uranium miner, including Cameco, was either cutting production, taking mines offline or was in financial trouble. And then you also had during the uranium bear market post Fukushima, you had a lot of extra supply overhang from the um, Japanese nuclear power plant companies like TEPCO and others that were just dumping their unused uh, supply back onto the market and reselling it. Yeah, you're 100% right, Jason. Um, and one of the big reasons that Kazakhstan was actually ramping supply so so rapidly, even in a declining price environment, was they had a significant currency arbitrage. So they had a rapidly depreciating Kazakh Tenge that, the, that, their, uh, that their costs were priced in, and then they were selling in US dollars. So it didn't really matter that the price continued to fall um, you know, there's plenty of conspiracy theories out there around uh, Russian influence on this ramping of price that effectively killed the United States uranium industry. And that's true. It did happen. Was that intentional? I don't really know. But um, the, most of the industry in multiple places around the world really, really got hurt during the, the mid-teens. And Kazakhstan's production peaked in 2016, which actually coincided with the bottom for the uranium price, uh, probably not coincidentally. So you're absolutely right. Huge oh. oversupply of the previous decade, primarily driven by Kazakhstan. It took a long time to work through a lot of above ground inventory. We are through that phase. There is very little, if any, mobile above ground inventory, at least not at these prices, sufficient to, to, to cause any sort of buffer in the market right now. It's incredibly tight. And 
an increased utility demand in the term and spot markets is going to move the price now. And there was a new report out. I don't know if you saw it since uh, we're recording this interview on Friday. I think it just came out in the last 24 hours that by 2030, the new projections are that nuclear power plant demand is going to increase by 28% for nuclear power electricity. Right. So that's report. That's data coming from the World Nuclear Association's uh, nuclear fuel report that they put out every two years. Um, that's a that's an interesting t- statistic, and I actually think that's on the low side, uh, primarily because they're that's literally just looking at the reference case scenario. So they produce a three different supply and demand models: the lower case, reference case, and upper case. And in all three of these scenarios, demand has risen over over the report they did two years ago. But what they're looking at is literally actually just uranium demand and the burn up of, of uranium in the operating reactors. So they're not talking about uh, inventory builds or they're not talking about any other supply aside from that. And I can tell you that the reference scenario probably is not baking in a lot of demand coming from small modular reactors, which are um, just now starting to kind of be built out. And we're seeing the first actual demand in the market to fuel a small modular reactor that's being built currently. That's that's an industry first, and that literally just happened this past week. Uh, so this uh, and inventories, commercial inventories are at historical lows. They're not necessarily at panic levels, and utilities will never let them get to panic levels because they don't have fuel to operate their plants, and they're they're in uh, in a pit of trouble. But um, last time we had commercial inventories at the levels they are currently was about 0405. And that was just before a massive run in the price of uranium. So that element is set up as well. And yes, a 28% uh, growth rate by 2030, that is looking at the reference scenario. That is looking at just the burn up of uranium in operating reactors for the years between now and then. It's not looking at building up inventories. It's not looking at secondary demand. And it's not looking at any sort of robust SMR demand either. So that number is probably significantly larger if you're actually talking about the the demand of uranium in total, not just by the operation of the plants. Uh, which countries have the most new nuclear power plants under construction right now? Uh, China by far, followed by, I believe, India. Um, China has, uh, just off the top of my head, 25, 26 reactors under construction currently. Six construction starts so far this year in China with an additional possibly eight in the next four to six months. Um, <laughs> they're building like crazy. India just uh, got commercial operation of their first 700 megawatt heavy water reactor. This is kind of a, a domestic design and built nuclear power plant. And they're wanting to build these in quote unquote fleet mode. That's their words. They want to build another eight to 10 of these reactors by the end of the decade. So China and then India are the most, and then followed up by a number of countries that are building one or two or three. Do you think then that this new documentary out in the last 12 months by famous Hollywood director, Oliver Stone, that's pro nuclear power. And he's trying to explain for our listeners out there, he's trying to explain to the green energy people, the environmentalists, the Hollywood types that are normally anti-nuclear power, that there's a lot of advantages to nuclear power, especially for a lot of these countries like Germany, Japan, that had rapid spikes in coal prices, in natural gas, and their manufacturers. There was a lot of jobs lost and economic upheaval with energy spikes because their manufacturers decided either they were shutting down manufacturing and that was job loss, or they were moving the manufacturing plants to other countries because there's not cheap electricity in those countries anymore. It's yeah, it's the the narrative has support on so many different fronts. It's pretty remarkable. Um, Oliver Stone's film. I don't know if you, if you watched the film, but I I thought it was really well done. Um, It took primarily a climate change angle, which I wasn't all that happy about to be completely honest, although I think it was strategic. Um, I personally believe there's so many incredible benefits of nuclear power that have nothing to do with reduced carbon emissions. But I think that was a strategic angle. There's uh, obviously a very, very large percentage of the population that is concerned about uh, climate change and uh, and carbon emissions and also anti-nuclear. And I think those are the people the film aimed to target. Um, one, one thing that the film did really well was go over a history of the anti-nuclear movement. And they went back to kind of the origins of the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club in the 1950s had a slogan that was um, uh, atoms, not dams. And so they were adamantly against hydroelectricity, which I myself am as well. And they were pro-nuclear. 
And the pro-nuclear side of things was, was pretty interesting because if you think of the Sierra Club, you don't think of nuclear power, right? But what happened was a fossil fuel uh, industry lobbyist basically cut a check to one of the co-founders of the Sierra Club. He started his own thing, I believe, was it the Friends of the Earth or the Natural Resources Defense Council? I'm forgetting which one. Cut him a check for a few hundred K, started this other entity, which is still in operation today. And all of a sudden they turned anti-nuclear and then eventually the Sierra Club did as well. But um, they went back and and explored that history and explored the huge and powerful and and incredibly momentous anti-nuclear movement that happened after Three Mile Island. And Three Mile Island, basically the reactor, while there was a partial meltdown of the core, the containment structure did exactly what it was designed to do and nobody was hurt by this incident yet there it spawned a huge movement against nuclear so that was a really really interesting part of that story that i thought was really well done but to answer the second part of your question jason there are a lot of um voices coming out in vocal support of nuclear that you would not have seen just a few years ago i mean the current miss america as a nuclear engineer i went to school for nuclear engineering Um, And she's obviously vocally advocating uh, nuclear. Elon Musk is talking about nuclear. Uh, Bill Gates is uh, investing in TerraPower, which is building one of the two demonstration projects in the country. Um, Sam Altman just invested invested in a SPAC that's going to be uh, uh, de-SPACing with Oklo, which is a micro reactor designer and, and developer. Um, I mean, the list goes on and we're just starting to see this narrative kind of come to the forefront and recognizing the benefits of nuclear, especially amongst the uh, the climate concerned crowd. But I was bringing up also the economic reasons, because over the long term, nuclear power by far has the it is the most energy dense and it has the most stable, cheap electricity prices. I mean, it's not even close when you're comparing nuclear power versus wind or solar. And unless natural gas stays cheap for a long period of time, I mean, the nuclear power is by far superior over different cycles. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And and of course, there's different elements that go into those calculations based on the different countries and areas that they operate in. So the, the plants, let's say, for example, in the United Arab Emirates that were built by the South Koreans recently, the Baraka plant, uh, and absolutely incredible success story for new nuclear builds. And they're going to be building more in the country, by the way. On time, on budget, brilliant. They're going to run for 80, possibly 100 years um, in an oil-rich country. It's just a phenomenal story. Then we go to the most recent large nuclear build in the United States, which is the Vogel plant in Georgia. This project bankrupted Westinghouse. It went $10 billion over budget, multiple years over budget. It was a mess. So uh, is it is it cheap energy? Generally speaking, yes. Um, a lot of times you'll have in the United States, for example, and in some of the other Western countries, uh, kind of bureaucracies that can impact that price. But generally speaking, nothing comes close to the energy that is returned based on the energy that is invested. And that's the most important metric, in my personal opinion, not carbon emissions, uh, not green, quote unquote, green energy, just the fact that the energy input is so minimal relative to what you get out and the incredible density that's what spells prosperity for humanity in my opinion so that's what i'm pulling for more than anything when it comes to nuclear and and you're absolutely right is the most stable reliable energy dense source and nothing can even come close to it yeah i mean over the long term economics will trump so you're going to see you're seeing in the short term a lot of western politicians still want to spend on esg and green energy and wind and solar but i mean if the project economics remain horrible for wind and solar and the electricity costs and the manufacturers in germany japan the us start to either leave the country, take jobs away, take away economic growth, take away tax revenues for governments, the politicians are going to change their direction, their policies on which way the wind is blowing. (laughs) No pun intended there with the (laughs) with the wind power joke. But I mean, like they're going to see that if the manufacturers say, look, our electricity costs are up, I don't know, 5x or 10x what happened in Germany, the absolutely insane what happened to them with natural gas prices. Uh, they're going to say we need to we need nuclear power here. We need to lock in cheap electricity so our manufacturers can compete, so they keep the jobs here and the um, tax revenues. Hundred percent. Yeah, I mean the German story is just such a great uh, a great example of what not to do. It really is on on so many levels. I mean, it made no sense whatsoever for them to shut down those perfectly good, brilliant uh, models of engineering the nuclear plants in in Germany and to put so much money five hundred billion dollars. <laughs> into wind and solar in a country that does isn't windy very often and uh, is is gray most of the time. I, I mean, I really, it doesn't make any sense at all other than a catering to a narrative and an ideology. 
And in the end, we really hope that physics will win out over ideology. And there's already some parties in Germany that are you know, running for uh, a political seats that are running essentially on a platform of we're going to restart the nuclear power plants and get the cheap, stable energy back in the country. Uh, but of course, the Greens are still doubling down on this and saying, yeah, those are never coming back online. Um, my friend Mark Nelson, who runs the Radiant Energy Fund out of out of Chicago, um, him and his team recently visited um, visited Germany and did sort of a forensic analysis of the nuclear plants that have been shut down most recently in the country. And they determined that eight of their plants could technically be restarted. That is, they have not yet been decommissioned to the point where restart doesn't make sense. So uh, fingers crossed on that, not holding my breath you know, in terms of Germany, but it is a wonderful, wonderful example. This is what happens when you shut down your perfectly good nuclear power plants and put all this money in wind and solar. Electricity prices skyrocket. You'll have blackouts. You'll have more pollution. They're 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 uh, decommissioning wind turbines to mine coal right now in Germany. It's absolute insanity, and the world is watching, and I love it. Well, also the economic reasons there too. You had the largest, uh, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, BASF. Right. They yeah. they left Germany. I think they yeah. went to China because they were going to get discounted or subsidized um, energy and electricity there. Yep, hundred percent. I think Volkswagen was talking about moving as well. I don't know if they actually did. It's it's going to hurt the economy of the country. It's going to hurt the GDP, and it's going to ultimately hurt the people. It's it was a terrible move. So there's also recent research reports coming out about nuclear waste, how we can recycle it better, improve it. Do you think the new generation four nuclear power plants that are being proposed, are those going to be able to recycle the nuclear waste and turn that into fuel? And then there's going to be very little nuclear waste because the new types of nuclear power plant builds that are being proposed and will be built probably in the next five or 10 years, the first couple test plants and then the eventual plants, that's going to be more efficient use of the old waste? You know, I, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but the short answer is is probably not. Um, I mean, some of these designs, I believe the molten salt thorium reactor can technically run on some nuclear waste. Um, and some of these reactors will produce less waste or waste that might be able to be recycled more easily. Um, I honestly think it's probably more of a, of a narrative piece than it is really uh, a substantial utilization of nuclear waste going forward, because a lot of people that are not too familiar with nuclear think the waste is a big problem. So I would argue that the existing large light water, pressurized water, boiling water, heavy water reactors produce a very, very small amount of waste already uh, relative to the energy that they produce. So um, most of, most folks that are in the industry don't really consider the waste a problem because they understand it. There's never been an accident with the waste. Um, it's it's highly radioactive for not a very long period of time. Yes, it's mildly radioactive for a long period of time, but there's perfectly good solutions for dealing with it. Will someday there be a cheaper, more efficient way to recycle it and reuse it? Yes, there's still a lot of uh, potential energy held, especially nuclear waste that's recently, you know, within a decade pulled out of a out of the core. So a lot of potential energy held there. Uh, at this point, it doesn't make economic sense to be uh, reprocessing this waste on scale the french are doing the japanese are building a plant to do it um, it's called mixed oxide or mox fuel where basically they pull out the plutonium of the spent fuel and they mix it with a little bit of fresh uranium and uh and can use repurposed plutonium from the waste into a uh, new fuel rod so the french utilize it to a decent extent but it's it's not necessarily cheap and there's a reason why it hasn't been mass adopted but there's hope on that front and it is a it is an exciting element a talking point when uh talking about expanding into advanced nuclear designs is this produces less waste than the light water reactor or this particular design can actually operate on recycled waste and perhaps someday in the future that will be the case but in my opinion i don't really think that's uh that that's probably number 10 on on the list of exciting and important elements of these new designs yeah to add to your points there i think Ariva, which is the kind of bureaucratic, large nationalized French nuclear power company. And they did mining and they did, um, they ran a lot of nuclear power plants inside France. And then they sold power, I think, to other European countries. And then they also were doing uh, recycling some of the techniques that you said, but I think they were actually losing a lot of money on the recycling. They were not run super efficiently and they were having a lot of financial problems a number of years ago. Right. Yeah. Ariva, which uh, changed its name to Arano a few years back, is is a French state-owned entity. So um, they're not always necessarily 
um, thinking along the lines of of uh, economic metrics with some of these uh, elements. So perhaps there's different incentives for that waste recycling with the MOX fuel, and it's it's only part of their uh, needs. So they they have like seventy to seventy five percent of their grid in France is powered by nuclear. Uh, but all of their plants are not operating on on recycled fuel. It's it's only a handful or a smaller percentage of the overall fuel needs for for those uh, nuclear power plants in France. Yeah, so I think they were doing the recycling for old nuclear fuel rods, but I think it was done inefficiently and it wasn't profitable for them. So they were doing it to, as like a proof of concept, but it was using an enormous amount of energy and it was uneconomic um, for the recycling. So it was more like a proof of concept thing to show they could do it rather than an economic business model for them. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's not a huge amount. Uh, the World Nuclear Association is basically saying that MOX fuel that's made from reprocessed plutonium and uranium is only about 2% of the new nuclear fuel used uh, globally on an annual basis. So outside of Kazakhstan, which uh, mines in which countries then are either under construction now or close to restarting? Outside of Kazakhstan, well, the Uzbeks are kind of like Kazakhstan light. They don't have the exact same uh, mineral wealth or geology, but it's similar. Um, they're they're producing about eight or nine million pounds a year. They're shooting to double that by 2030. Um, there's ISR uranium mining being developed as a joint venture between Mongolia and Arano, the French. And that is also slated for late decade first production. You have, let's see, what's under development. Um, in Saskatchewan, Canada, NextGen is moving towards development as well as Denison with their Phoenix deposit. NextGen has a very large, very high-grade underground uh, deposit in the southwest of the basin. Incredible financial metrics on this project, on the Aero project, and they are in, this, in, the, in the stages of um, environmental impact and early stages of permitting. So they could have their permits as soon as next year, possibly if things go smoothly with first production in probably 2028, maybe maybe slightly sooner if absolutely everything goes perfectly smooth, which never does in the mining industry. Denison's the similar time frame. They're looking at ISR development of, of their Phoenix deposit in Saskatchewan. There's a bunch of companies moving towards production in the United States, uh, primarily with ISR production, uh, especially that would be Encore Energy based in Texas and Wyoming, uh, Uranium Energy Corporation also in Texas and Wyoming. Um, Peninsula was moving towards that, but they kind of had a rug pull uh, with their processing facility from Uranium Energy. So they're trying to revamp and build their own facility. UR Energy is producing a little bit in Wyoming. Um, outside of the US and Canada, and uh, well, Global Atomic is, is moving forward in Niger, despite the fact that there's this coup. It probably is going to delay their their development slightly, primarily due to financing being delayed because of the destabilization in the country that's been happening over the past few weeks. Um, but it's the highest grade deposit, best deposit on the entire continent. It will be a mine at some point. They were shooting for first production in 2025. Whether or not they still hit that, probably unlikely. But um, that will be a mine, and that will be a mine probably sooner than the mines in Canada. Um, and eventually we'll see some new stuff come on in Namibia when the prices get higher under development. Currently, I don't believe there's anything happening there. Currently, uh, we've got a couple of restarts happening in Australia. Boss is restarting the honeymoon project in South Australia. That is, um, that is an ISR project, just a couple million pounds a year, a few years out. And uh, BHP is probably going to expand. They're also in Australia, but uranium is kind of a, a bonus. They primarily, uh, mine gold and copper in their Olympic Dam mine. It's a massive mine, but they get, you know, seven, eight, nine million pounds of uranium a year out of that mine. They might produce a little bit more. The Russians are developing, um, of course, in Kazakhstan, you said aside from Kazakhstan, but there's new new mines being developed there. I believe there's a mine or two being developed in Russia, although they don't have a lot of uranium in Russia. Oh, Probably Olympic missing Dam's one or Olympic two, but those are the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, Olympic Dam has been running, I think, for 100 years, but it's mostly a base metal mine. It's got a polymetallic stuff, and I think the uranium is a byproduct, but the grades on that are so low. I think the cost for for mining a lot of the base metals are sky high compared to what they used to be because the grades are so low now for the base metals. Interesting. Yeah, they've, they've been kind of a, a a spot market or a shorter term contract spot referenced seller for forever. Um, so because their uranium, like you said, is a byproduct, they don't primarily mine uranium, but there is some uranium in that mine. It's a gigantic mine. Wasn't a Paladin Energy also restarting a mine? Wasn't it under construction yep. in the last couple of years? Yep, you're right. I forgot about that one. Paladin's Langer Heinrich mine is currently um, in uh, in restart. 
So they were previously producing that that was halted, I think 2016 or 17, if I recall correctly, possibly sooner than that. So yeah, they should have some production, I believe next year. And I think they should be at full production 2025. That is uh, five and a half million pounds a year. They've got a significant offtake from the Chinese. Um, so not a lot of production coming into the market from that, but it's something. Yeah, you're right. Is that Zambia or Namibia? Or... That's Namibia. Yep, Namibia. Yeah, Namibia. I, I think they have similar geology, so get them mixed up. Right. So uh, in general, the, these potential new mines and resorts, is is this going to be a significant amount of production? Is this going to be comparable to any of the mines that Cameco uh, has that could they could bring online or the ones that Kazataprom has? Um, nothing compares to Kazakhstan's geology and, and their mineral resource. I mean, on the only Australia has an incredible mineral resource, but they don't have the same geology and they don't have the same political support only in, uh, South Australia and West Australia. I believe it's still illegal to mine in Queensland. Um, but as far as the mines coming online this decade, by far the, the largest is next gen's arrow. Um, that's, that's a really, really big project that can produce potentially up to like 27, 28 million pounds a year, but I believe it's only for seven or eight years. It would operate like that still massive, absolutely massive. That's the biggest by far. Um, these, some of these mines that are uh, being developed in Kazakhstan are, are quite large as well. The Budenovskoy six and seven, I don't remember the joint venture with Arano, but it's a pretty chunky one as well. Um, but really what we're looking at with all of these mines potentially coming online is if you model out supply and demand out to 2030 and you make an assumption that all of the mines that are slated to be developed and producing based at a certain price point and you model out those expected price points and you expect that they all do come online on time, we still end up with a very, very large, you know, I'm talking north of 300 million pounds cumulatively between now and 2030, shortfall in supply uh, relative to demand. Um, and I don't really know how that gets di disrupted. I don't know what sort of supply is going to be able to come online to fill that gap. It's really a big question. Uh, is everybody that I am connected with in this sector and also our own work, we see a supply deficit going out as far as we can see into the future. We're not really sure how that's going to be addressed. So um, we should see significantly higher prices. Of course, if we can get quickly to north of $100 a pound, let's say, and it sustains there, and there is uh, sufficient capital available for the lower, excuse me, the higher cost, lower grade projects, primarily in Namibia, to get into development, that will help. So if we can see, for example, Forces uh, project, I'm forgetting the name of their project, my apologies. Uh, Forces, um, Bannerman's project, Itango, Deep Yellow's project, like those three very large, very low grade projects in Namibia, if they can be developed in that five to seven year time frame, that's going to help with that supply deficit. But uh, it's really not looking good on the supply side relative to demand, and that also calls into question how much demand, extra demand are we going to see from small modular reactors? How much financial buying will happen if we see markets go severely risk on into this sector? Could really buy up a lot of whatever's uranium left available in the spot market, which isn't a lot at the moment. It's hard to say what's going to fill that gap. I, I, I can't tell you what it's going to be, if it's going to be at all. But higher prices sooner and a capital environment supportive of development projects is going to definitely help. And really, if you're pulling for nuclear energy's expansion, we need higher prices. We need all of these projects to be developed. Well, the prices have to stay high, though. So the right. you have to have the spot price and the contract price stay above a certain level for a certain period of time. I think the average person who's not familiar with the commodity sees a spike in the commodity prices and thinks that a lot of new supply will come online. But if it's a mining company involved, it's not like an oil and natural gas well, where in six weeks or eight weeks, they can start drilling a new well and have production. The mining, the mining industry is not like that at all, especially in an environment like this, Justin, where on the supply side, yeah, you have the big rally in uranium spot prices and the contract price. But on the other part of this, which I think will restrict supply, you have higher interest rates, you have inflation, you have costs going up for a lot of the miners, especially diesel costs, uh, labor costs if they're an emerging market, and then cost of capital, which is because everything's priced off what the 10-year interest rate and rising interest rates. So then the cost of capital for miners, um, for a lot of miners, is going to be much higher, I would say. 
You're a hundred percent, a hundred percent right, Jason. Uh, capital is not cheap right now. So it's not easy. Even once we get above the incentive price for these projects, it's not like all of a sudden we hit $75 uranium and, and we've got an, an additional 20 million pounds coming out of Namibia that year. You know, it's just not how it works. Uh, you know, we have to hit those prices. We have to have the development companies secure a certain amount of long-term contracts for de-risking and also not only de-risking the development, but de-risking the capital investment. So uh, a bank is less likely to, to lend to a development project if they have no um, no contracts in hand. And one exception to that might be like next gen's arrow. They say they already have a billion dollars of interested capital, interested financing for the development of that project, which is going to take one to th- 1.3 to 1.5 billion to build that, but it gets paid off in less than a year. That's how high grade it is. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Well, you know, how, it's how there's long, so many risks. Yeah. Well, how long does it take then on average to potentially build even like a smaller medium size you're in mind? Is it going to take five years, seven years, 10 years in a, in a normal environment. Oh, on average, it's something like 15 years plus, but it actually, it really, really depends on where. And of course, when, to your point with interest rates, right? So you could argue that a lot of the development happened in, in, in terms of, you know, like the shale boom in the oil industry happened due specifically to very, very low 0% interest rates. Um, but in this environment right now, five, six, seven plus interest rates, capital is very expensive. So um, in a country like Kazakhstan, even where it's very, very fast to go from discovery to production, you're, st- you're still looking at years. Um, in a country like the United States or a country like Canada, uh, Namibia, you need um, you need that proven out deposit. You need to de-risk that development, not only with incentive pricing in the market, with sufficient long-term contracts to de-risk, but you have to have willing capital as well. It's not I'm Mining is a terribly difficult business. And none of these companies survived a bear market and are now in the business of doing the industry a favor. They're all going to be looking for profit. And, and that's just how, how it works. So uh, higher prices are absolutely necessary given this uh, significant and drastic supply shortfall that's going out to the end of the decade and beyond. Yeah, I agree. I think I think these companies are going to be very careful about bringing out new supply. I don't think Cameco is going to be rushing to increase production at Cigar Lake and MacArthur River. A lot of people might not be aware, but Cigar Lake had flooding problems for many years. So the cost, it didn't come on ta- online on time and on budget. So there's been a lot of problems for a lot of these uranium mines. And then, like you said, probably because it's radioactive, all the extra permitting, going through all the regulatory agencies, especially in countries like the US, Canada, Australia, probably takes years longer to bring a uranium mine online than bringing online a copper mine or a gold mine. Yeah, it's there's there's unique challenges to uranium. Uh, you're absolutely right, um, and it depends on where it's being built and and what type of mine it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just no guarantees with the supply side. I mean, that's really kind of the big takeaway, probably for your audience is demand is stable and rising. Supply is in question, and it's it's challenged in in multiple different locations for multiple different reasons. Um, I don't really see a supply panacea coming in at any point soon. So we should see at the very least a significant rise in the uranium price for the next few years to at least get us to that incentive price. Of course, it always overshoots. Um, I think it's a practical guarantee we're going to see north of hundred dollars a pound, pound, and probably within the next eighteen to twenty four months. Um, the equity should perform very, very well if that happens. But beyond that, it's hard to say. Typically, those prices will overshoot to the upside in a bull market, overshoot to the downside in a bear market, which they did. You know, the incentive price for uh, even for Kazakhstan miners, uh, you know, when we got to 18 bucks a pound, they weren't making a lot of money there. Uh, barely any money whatsoever. And they were only making money because of that currency arbitrage. But, uh, you know, we needed 30 to 35 back in 2016 and we were at 18 bucks a pound. So it's going to overshoot. How far it overshoots, that will entirely or mostly be up to um, how panicked the industry gets and or how much capital flows into the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, into Yellow Cake PLC, into Zuri Invest, into any of these other physical acquisition funds that are being set up currently, which there are multiple supposedly. Um, So if if risk comes on and money flows into these physical funds, the price could go to heights that make absolutely no sense whatsoever for the industry. That, of course, is not the bet we're making. We're making a bet on understanding the supply and demand fundamentals, the growth of the sector, 
and uh, and where the price needs to go to incent those marginal projects. And beyond that, it's basically just gravy to the upside. Uh, last question here before I let you go. I think there is probably investment opportunity, although there may be um, government restricting this with rules, regulations, red tape blocking this. But there's cl- clearly supply problems here in the U.S., not with mo- mining uranium necessarily, but there's even worse supply problems, I would argue, with uranium enrichment processing. There's a big bottleneck here in the U.S. because the U.S. has to import a lot of the enriched uranium from countries like Russia and other countries. Do you think that there, uh, that the regulators will switch things and then there will be good investment opportunities for that for investors hard to say on the investment opportunities front um so right now you have centrist energy which is uh starting to produce halo high asset low enriched uranium that's the higher enrichment level uh, that is necessary for some of these advanced projects and the reason that they're they've got a doe contract to produce the first halo because of these demonstration projects. The two demonstration projects being built right now are TerraPower's Naturium Reactor in Wyoming and X Energy's XE100 being built in Washington. Both of these demonstration designs operate on HALU and the United States doesn't have its own enrichment essentially. So Centris is here in the US, but they they don't own their, their centrifuges are actually owned by the government. So it's hard to really, it's hard to hang your hat on the investment case for Centris, but uh, the stock tends to have a lot of leverage when things are moving. Um, GLE is Global Laser Enrichment. It is co-owned by Silex, an Australian listed company, and Cameco. That is moving towards, um, it's looking increasingly likely that it's going to happen. This is moving towards the building of a facility in Paducah um, in Kentucky, I believe, where they will be able to re-enrich tails material from prior enrichment processes in the past using lasers. Um, fantastic, incredible new uh, new technology that should be a source of UF six, you know, in about five years, and that's going to help because conversion is limited. Um, we're seeing support coming from the federal government. There is multiple bills throughout Congress happening right now at various stages, running through the legislature that that have some element or another supporting nuclear, and a lot of them are focusing on supporting the fuel cycle. So we should see some further support for conversion and enrichment coming from the federal government, noting that shortfall. Even though we have conversion, we don't have necessarily a domestic enricher besides Centris. Um, Urenco does have a facility in New Mexico, but that's owned by uh, by uh, by the British. Um, but it is a big bottleneck. But with all that said, we're producing almost no uranium right now either. I think we've produced a couple hundred thousand pounds of uranium in the United States this year. Uh, and, and the nuclear power plants in the United States consume 45 million pounds a year. So that's a major, major shortfall. Of course, our friendly neighbors to the north have plenty of uranium, and we have plenty of uranium. We're just not mining it yet, but we're moving towards that. I think if we see the prices we're expecting and we see um, these various companies in the U.S. get into development, we could see 5 million pounds of production maybe two or three years from now. We could see 10 million pounds maybe five years from now if things go really, really well in the U.S. on that front. And you think with all the inflation that's been happening globally, so there's, a, I would argue there's even more inflation outside the developed countries, so outside the United States, European Union, that in the emerging markets where a lot of this uranium mining would occur, that costs are up even more. So you think then that there's going to have to be higher price floors then for uranium mining to be economic. So instead of say, I think you said $35 a pound uranium was economic years ago, I don't think any of these projects are going to be economic at 35 a pound with much higher capital costs, interest rates in an emerging market. The, the mining labor unions want much higher wages. I think we're looking at at least between 50 and $65 a pound as new price floors going forward. Yep. I agree with you. Um, Kazakhstan can't even make money at 35 bucks now uh, due to inflation, due to the fact that Kazanoprom is partially public and they have a big dividend that they pay their Their fully allocated cost is at least in the mid to high thirties, if not low forties. So at 61 bucks a pound, they're making a lot of money, but most projects around the world still need higher prices to really, really incentivize based on all the things that you just mentioned with inflation, the cost of capital, et cetera. Um, and I agree. I think inflation is a big concern. Um, despite the Fed's efforts, you know, it, and inflation has come down, but I think a, the biggest driver of that is is the price of oil, and that's a supply story uh, more so than it is a demand destruction story. And I, if if oil remains at a decently high price, or let alone rises uh, from here, 
it, it's going to increase the, the cost of everything. So whether that's true quote unquote inflation that basically essentially coming, comes from the increasing of the money supply, it's still an increased cost across the board of basically everything from everyday life, including mining. So yes, you're absolutely right. The incentive price just continues to rise. And I'll give you one quick example. I know we want to cut it off here pretty soon here, but um, Paladin in November of 2021, uh, they had put out, excuse me, November of last year, they had put out a cost estimate for the restart of the Langer Heidner project that I believe it was 81 million uh, Australian. They had they revised that less than six months later up to 118 million. That's how quickly the cost had risen for a restart of an existing mine. So yes, uh, if the industry thinks that we're going to stop here at 61 bucks and all of a sudden uranium is going to come falling from the sky, I mean they got something else coming. That's the one in Namibia, right? Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier Namibia has low grade mines. I mean, that some of that supply could take 10, 15, 20 years to bring online and it's lower grade. It's gonna, it's high capex. It's gonna need much high, it's gonna need uranium prices to stay at 60, 65, 70, 75 dollars a pound for years in order for investors to uh expend the capital, the mining companies to commit, they're gonna have to get those supply contracts, like you said. So if the uranium price goes back lower, those projects will be delayed or canceled again. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the companies that are uh, explorers, uh, potential developers in Namibia right now. So we're sitting here at 61 bucks a pound spot. I think term is uh, 58. But uh, really, the contracts that are being signed right now are primarily, if not entirely market reference with floors in the mid 50s and ceilings in the 80s. Um, yet, none of these companies are even starting to talk about, let alone think about starting to develop these mines in Namibia. So we're talking 75, probably 85 bucks a pound sustained for the Bannermans and the Deep Yellows and the Forces and, and those types of companies in Namibia too, to start to actually talk about financing the development of those mines. We're a ways away from that happening. And, and even when that happens, we're talking about multiple years hundreds of millions, if not billions, to develop these mines. And, and even then, it's still no guarantee. Famously, the Chinese purchased the Husab deposit. Um, I think this was kind of the early 2010s. Their uh, development of that project went billions of dollars over budget, billions of dollars over budget. It's a huge deposit in Namibia, very low grades. They're now they're producing, you know, I think something like 12, 13 million pounds a year. All that uranium just goes back to China. Um, but that was that was a massive cost overshoot. It took longer and it cost way more than they expected when they first purchased that that land. So um, there's just there's just no guarantees on the supply side. There really isn't. Well, Justin, you are a true wealth of information on uranium and nuclear power. Honestly, you have to spend hours a day to be able to talk like this. Just fire points off. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Yeah, and I do. <laughs> it's it's all I do, really. So it's it's a it's a fascinating sector. I really I actually really love what I do. It's it keeps me on my toes. Uh, that's for sure. It has been very stressful at moments, um, but it's been very rewarding, and I'm super excited about the future here for sure. I am too. I think I think the bull market has definitely restarted now. I think there could be a ups and downs roller coaster, but I think the uranium and nuclear power renaissance or bull market has finally restarted after over ten years of the bear market with post Fukushima. But I want to thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed this discussion. I mean, I have to re-listen to it. There were so many points you re you uh, mentioned off so quickly. Yeah, it's truly my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for reaching out. I'm happy to come back anytime, Jason. And uh, please promote Uranium Insider. Obviously, if you're, if you're uh, talking about these points so rapidly, you really know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've I've been doing this since 2019. I've been in the sector since about 2016 when I first discovered the investment thesis. Um, I have a, a business partner who's a retired hedge fund guy, a really brilliant guy. We've got a small team behind us. We launched this in August of 2019. Since then, we forexed our investment um, three, over 300% returns since August of 2019. The benchmark URA has returned a little over 100%. So we've almost 3x the benchmark. We're very proud of those results. And we, we spend every single day in and out of this sector. We we cover the equities we feel are the best risk reward investments. We do monthly members only webinars with industry uh, industry players that are very insightful. I do an almost daily uh, video update for our paying members. And then of course we put out a 35 to 40 page newsletter once a month. It's we're all in on this. Um, we've, we cover the sector so much that uh, we've often taken on a role of almost like a therapist or psychologist with with our with our members in some cases because we've gone through very volatile periods of time. You know, we had a 
40 to 50% drawdown from the November 2021 highs to the lows over the past year. Um, and during that time, we saw no problems whatsoever on the fundamental story. In fact, it only got better over that same period of time. So we were able to, uh, every time we saw the equities wash out, either um, convince our paying members essentially to hang in there and or started pounding the table on adding to positioning because the fundamental story, the nuclear fuel cycle, you have to understand it to hang on in the sector. Volatility can be gut-wrenching and you have to know what's happening in the physical market. So we put a lot of time and effort into understanding the physical market. We speak with fuel buyers, we speak with uranium traders, um, and that information is distilled down to our membership to what exactly do you need to know to uh, to have confidence to put money to work in this sector because it can be so incredibly volatile. And I think we've done a great job with that. And uh, man, the future looks incredibly bright for nuclear and uranium stocks are still cheap relative to the metal, in my opinion. So should be a good wave three. I think we're in the first few weeks of wave three, which could last uh, you know six to 12 months or longer. Could be a good run coming up here soon. Uh, the long-term chart on Cameco is beautiful now, especially the last three years, because it looks like in early to mid-2020, we put in a bottom, and then on the dips, the dips were bought, and it's in a nice, strong uptrend there. So when I was, uh, I became bullish on uranium in 2020 because I was looking at the entire energy picture. So not just uranium and nuclear power, I was looking at oil, natural gas, coal, uh, the countries that were shutting down the nuclear power plants, they're spiking electricity costs. And I was like, what are they doing with their bad policies and the ESG stuff? Nuclear just makes so much sense. And the uranium shares were hated. I mean, when I was writing positive articles for my paying subscribers on Patreon back in 2020 and 2021, the stuff was just negative, negative, negative about <laughs> nuclear power, the long bear market. And I was like, well, I'm onto something here because sentiment, can it really get any more bearish? Yeah, and that great timing too, Jason. I mean, obviously the COVID lows were the low point for so many different industries and sectors. But um, yeah, this the the fundamental story was very good back then. And it's only it's just it's on steroids now. I mean, I can't even believe we're talking about potentially new nuclear in the United States. Um, we've we've got just an, an absolute incredible movement embracing nuclear right now that wasn't there just three years ago. So supply and demand story has only improved, but even the narrative around the around the industry has gotten so much better. And, and that should portend uh, a lot of support for the sector going forward. It could be a very, very long and robust kind of super cycle type move for the sector. Especially if the countries want their economic growth, because uh, you can't really have economic growth without cheap energy and cheap electricity. And if you build a nuclear power plant close to on time and on budget, not the one that you said earlier with Georgia, where the costs were almost double over 10 billion or something like that extra. And they took like many years extra, uh, many years longer than projected. But if you can actually build a nuclear power plant on time and on budget, the electricity costs here, you buy, you have the lowest electricity cost by far then for your manufacturers and your economy, your consumer, your small businesses. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I always kind of think that um, based on any individual country and any country's leadership, if they are uh, sincere, critical thinkers and they sincerely want to do the best for their people, that that a movement towards or re-embracing of nuclear is, is the obvious move. And honestly, that to me is probably the biggest unforeseen possible quote unquote bear case is just countries not doing the right thing, the quote unquote right thing. Luckily, Germany is essentially the outlier on that front. In fact, even Sweden that shut down a nuclear reactor, perfectly good reactor two years ago, is talking about building new nuclear. Belgium that shut down reactors last year is life extending their last couple of reactors. So Germany's kind of an outlier there, and that's positive. Um, I admit my trust in governments to do the right thing for their populace is, is very, very low. But I am watching what is happening, not what I want to happen. And what is happening is there's a lot of money and a lot of momentum and a lot of support happening for nuclear around the world, with the exception of Germany. So that's that's what we're looking at. It's important to look at what is, not what you want in terms of investing theses. So we focus on what's actually happening in the fuel cycle, in the physical market, and of course, with uh, with new builds as well.